Hello, hello, my dear viewers, my colleagues, my friends. Um, welcome uh, in a new episode of the Moskvich podcast. And today I have a very uh, special guest. His name is Robert Fleischer from Germany. And I think uh, he is the only guy maybe covering UAP uh, on his own German uh, language podcasting channel and he has over 100,000 subscribers so let this be an inspiration to you guys subscribe to my channel too and uh, without further ado I'm gonna pull up my German colleague Robert Fleischer hello sir hi Max thank you so much for inviting me and of all the special guests that you've already interviewed I guess I'm the least special guy <laughs> no I think you are very special because um and that's very much uh, uh, location bound I think because we've talked before and you uh, explained to me that the German audience the the, the UAP topic is still very much um, uh, a, a stigmatic uh, topic uh, uh, at it my is. neighbor's uh, side, huh? you know, we're neighbors. I'm uh, from the Netherlands. You're German. We uh, live uh, right uh, side by side. Um, so can you maybe, uh, first of all, tell me a little bit about you and how you perceive the German reaction to the UAP disclosure of the last three years? Go ahead, sir. All right. So I'm a, a former TV mainstream journalist. I used to work for a public uh, um, networks like uh, the uh, one of the uh, TV station that belongs to ARD in Germany, so that's like the BBC in in Great Britain, and um, and then at one point I decided, and this is the very short version actually. <laughs> at one point I decided to uh, uh, to stop working there and making up my my own um, uh, online uh, TV channel, if you will. So it's an it's an online a subscription based online magazine called Exo Magazine. Exo Magazine. Um, Exo Magazine dot TV, and I also I founded uh, Exopolitik dot org. Uh, which is the citizen movement, uh, which existed before Exo Magazine TV. Uh, I'll and put I it just, all in uh, the subscription. Thank you, thank you. And I uh, and I um, founded that because uh, in Germany at that time, in back in two thousand seven, um, there was absolutely no viable information in the in the mainstream, nothing. Um, and the um, UFO community was actually dominated by um ideological skeptic person uh who um who was always invited to tv shows when it ever came to the subject of ufos and it was always about uh, uh tie lanterns um misidentified aircraft it was never you know he, he never even had one case that um where he where that left any question mark to him and he was always presented to be the only person in germany who professionally deals with ufos who receives ufo sighting reports and that was actually wrong because even at that time there were three registered associations ufo research <laughs> associations but they were never invited on television right. um and um and this person um, he was uh, he was also dominating the 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 whole UFO sector. So whenever there was some discussion going up or coming up about some interesting case somewhere, you know, he sure was there and started to, you know, sometimes to to really say bad things on a, on a, on a very personal level, you know. Um, and I just didn't want to get involved in this um, whole German um association meddling and you know and so i just founded this exopolitik.org and later on exo magazine tv um right. because uh, somehow i had to refinance my my research and what i've been doing is i've um i'm a journalist i'm not a ufo researcher that's important i'm not um visiting uh, ufo witnesses and questioning them about their experiences but i rely on um, reliable, serious UFO researchers, and I go to uh, national archives, I, I look at military documents, I talk to trained eyewitnesses, 
I talk to pilots, I talk to um, military intelligence uh, people. Um, and now, Robert, I, is that something you do uh, uh, only in Germany, uh, German witnesses, German pilots? Or no. do you take it outside of the borders of Germany? No, actually, that, and that's the point. I, I'm, I've been focusing on uh, bringing the international um, information to Germany. So I spend a considerable time and effort to uh, translate the reliable material that's been out there. Uh, for example, I subtitled the whole Disclosure Project press conference into German. I subtitled um, James Fox's and Leslie Kane's press conferences into German. I subtitled the UFOs and Nukes press conference into German. Wow. Um, and so um, and so, the subscribers of my uh, online uh, video uh, magazine, they all have both versions, the original version and the German version. So sometimes I interview people in English and sometimes even in French or Spanish, and, and then you would have um, the uh, original version uh, and a German professionally dubbed version. And um, wow. yeah. That's and, impressive. Uh, that's impressive. I got, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. That's, that's a lot of work. It is. Um, I can tell you. It's very expensive, it, too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, you know, it shows your love uh, for covering this uh, this topic because you are so uh, going so far to uh, make sure the German audience can understand it in their own language. Yes, that's important because there are not so many people who really do understand English well, let alone other languages. And I, I have the, the privilege to have studied uh, conference interpreting, so I speak a couple of more languages which come in quite handy here. And it's also it's very useful, especially in this field where most of the reliable information and most of the interesting stuff is actually happening outside of Germany and not inside Germany. I mean, I don't want to say that nothing interesting is happening in Germany. I... Um, yeah. There are a couple of uh, compelling cases, but and I am curious um, about those. <laughs> yes, yes, we can talk about them. Um, but the problem is that uh, it's all uh, highly classified. If if there is any uh, at all, that, that's the point. If you ask the German government, um, how do you deal with UFO reports? They say we just don't deal with them. There are there are no UFO reports. There is nothing like that. Um, same, we went yeah, to the here. to the press conference of the German government twice um, and asked the speaker of the German government um, whether um, whether now that the the French have released their files and the British have released their files, whether the Germans would also consider releasing their files. <laughs> you know, and you should have seen the uh, the reaction both of the audience and the speakers of the government. You know, they started laughing at me, <laughs> like open, oh, bluntly, yeah. openly laughing at me, and said, "This is not even on the, on the periphery of the German politics. It's not important at all." Um, there is nothing to it. If you ask the German military um, how they deal with UFOs, they say they seriously claim that they have never even had, never, never even once had any anomalous uh, phenomenon on their radar screens. That's funny because the, uh, I, I um, uh, sent a, a FOIA request uh, to to our uh, uh, forces, and uh, they replied. And the official statement was, we've never seen any UFOs. Uh, but then again, we are noticing sometimes unknown, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically the same as a UFO because it's unidentified or you call it unidentified flying object or you call it unknown. It's basically the same. They just uh, gave it a little different qualification, um, So, uh, which was very interesting to me. And they actually replied to me that there are uh, uh, accounts of UFO hotspots they are aware of, and one of them is Soesterberg. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting case. I'm really looking forward to interviewing you about that. Um, here, I have um, an, an official uh, quotation, a quote from the German um, then Minister of Defense. I um, I wrote him a letter asking uh, for information, and he's and this is his answer. Throughout the existence of the Bundeswehr, so the German military, there has been no case in which an initially unidentified flying object was attributed to an extraterrestrial origin. Accordingly, the Federal Ministry of Defense does not keep any records of the UFO phenomenon. And in other in other answers from members of the public. Uh, 
the uh, or the German, German military went as far as to state categorically that since the foundation of the Bundeswehr, they never had anything on their radar screens, on their radar screens, screens, hell, <laughs> on their radar <laughs> screens, which they could not eventually identify. So you see, that's right. the German Gründlichkeit, German exactness, uh, the, the preciseness. Yeah. You know, we're so precise. We're so, you know, there's just no secrets for us, for our military. We're far ahead of all the other militaries, especially the Swiss military, because they, <laughs> they have registered anomalous radar returns on their Swiss radar screens over uh -huh. German territory more than once. <laughs> So and, how and is they, it possible? You know, how is it possible and, that the Swiss have registered that and the Germans haven't? As, uh, yeah, question: uh, Are those files uh, um, accessible? The the Swiss have uh, released. Yeah, there are Swiss uh, some Swiss um, files. They're not too um, exciting, I have to say. The um, the radar um, printouts that I just referred to, uh, they are they were actually leaked in a way. Um, uh -huh. There is no question about their as to their authenticity, so they are authentic. Uh, there are yeah. lots of them. Um, German UFO researcher Ilof Brandt von Ludwiger, who is an astrophysicist and who is Germany's foremost and oldest uh, UFO researcher, um, he has uh, received and analyzed and studied together with a group of, ex of radar experts <laughs> those radar printouts. And um, he uh, he gave a presentation. I once invited him to my hometown um, and give a presentation about UFOs on radar. And he has quite a lot of this stuff. Um, you can see objects that within um, four minutes or so, they change their flight altitude several times from uh, thousands of feet to as low as 500 feet or so. Um, yeah. That is something that is really difficult to obtain with an with a normal uh, conventional technology. Also, you see objects that um, that accelerate to Mach 4, so that's four times the speed of sound, and then they make a sharp angle turn and disappear from the radar screen. And it's also very strange because if you, I mean, with that always speed, when you I cannot do this, that. When yeah, when when I show this on in my presentations, when I'm invited somewhere and I show this radar uh, printout, you know, I show this object which makes this makes this sharp angle turn. I always say, kids, don't try this at home, you know, because no. you never know what happens. I mean, even if you would try it at home, um, even if you, if you try it on with eighty kilometers on the highway, you know, you know what would happen. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't drive a sharp angle. You, you your your car would uh, tumble. Would, would, crash and and you know you would eventually die and also um, if you do that with the plane uh the human body cannot handle that stress if you exactly have, there's have the, that the, that speed and then make a a a, a, a u-turn yes, that's that's, is, uh, that's that, physically um, not possible mass inertia law which just says that the mass will want to continue in the direction towards it was it, it accelerated and you can just not make a sharp angle turn at mach 4 it's impossible no. and uh, even at lower speeds it's impossible so um so that's interesting those objects that are flying around here um they do not only not comply with our air safety uh, air flight regulations but they do not even comply with our natural laws and um and so uh, and and i find this highly interesting and for example on may 5th 1996 there was an unidentified radar return um captured by a swiss radar station um in uh, near an early warning radar station in messstetten in baden württemberg so that's in the south southwest of of germany right. um and there you can see there it's an unidentified radar return uh, in you can see i have the printout here in front of me awesome. um and it's and and there should just nothing be in there in that region because it's a no-fly zone around that nato station um right well it's around the nato station yeah it's around a nato station and and um so that's the that's the thing that when you when you ask the government you constantly get you're being laughed at, you're being uh, ridiculed. Um, there's no answer whatsoever. Now that has slightly changed now because uh, now that the Americans have um, released their stuff um, yeah. and continue to do so, and especially the report of the Office of Director of National Intelligence, um, it has become quite difficult for the German government and the German military to deny the mere existence of the object, of the phenomenon. 
Right. And so um, and so they uh, limit themselves to saying we were not involved in this and um, we don't need any UFO reporting system here anyway because our surface is so small compared to the United States that there are so few cases that we never have anything. Um, and so we've never actually been dealing with that. And there may be there may be um, an explanation to why they are reacting like that. If, if you want me, I can go straight to a, a case which may explain that. Please do. Okay. I have one question, I have one question yes. before we go there. Uh, <clears throat> so the army, the German army stated to you that since the, uh, the, uh, the Bundeswehr, the Bundeswehr's existence, uh, there has never been any official UFO encounter whatsoever. They have now, never, they have, they never had anything on their radar screens, which they could not eventually identify. Right. So they okay, could so, actually identify everything. There's nothing unidentified left for the Germans. You right. see? So here's the question. Here's the question. <laughs> um, so is this when the German army was re-established after the Second World War or even before that time? Because I know for a fact um, uh, the, 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 the German uh, army during the war, uh, I know they were actively looking for extraterrestrial life. I know that. Yeah. Well, that was uh, the German Bundeswehr was founded yeah. after World War II. So that's after World War II. So that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, please continue. So there are some there are some interesting cases. Um, for example, one of the recent uh, cases you asked me about the the Bremen Airport incident, which you're interested in. Um, that yes, is something I, that is not too. Um, um, we don't. We hardly don't know anything about it. Uh, what What happened is, was that the whole um, airport was shut down on January sixth, two thousand fourteen. Right. Because in the evening at around 6 p.m., uh, an air traffic controller in the control tower noticed a strange signal on the primary radar. And he looked out of the tower. It was about five and a half kilometers south of the runway. And he looked out of the tower and could see an object with red and green lights, even without binoculars. And, um, and so they decided to cancel incoming flights. And another plane from Munich was diverted to another airport. A right. plane from Paris had to abort its landing, but was then able to land um, a quarter of an hour later. Uh, Bremen air traffic control informed the police about the unidentified flying object. The police requested a police helicopter, which also searched uh, the airspace for the UFO. And radio patrol cars also went in search of the object and found it. Um, the officers who observed found the UFO... It. They, they saw it. They saw it from oh. the ground. They said it, it, they described it as a larger flying object about the size of a helicopter. Um, and, um, and it, and, and then it disappeared. It, sometimes they say it was visible. Sometimes it disappeared. Um, the police helicopter also, uh, searched, uh, for that thing. And, um, I talked to the, um, at that time, if I remember well, I talked to the press um, spokesperson of the German um, air safety board, uh, air safety air controllers um, um, network, and they and she said that uh, they had seen an unlit an unlit object, an object that was not lighted. Um, from the helicopter which is interesting so if yeah. it's um the original object was lit up and then it was not lit up and sometimes it was visible sometimes it disappeared um this went on for about three hours and then uh, the police helicopter stopped searching um there were also eyewitnesses who lived near the airport said they were sure uh, they had not seen any aircraft because th they had been of course used to seeing aircraft living in the vicinity of an airport so they knew what an aircraft looks like um and um it was not a plane they said now uh nothing no one knows anything the only thing that we know is it's um it's a it's a dangerous incursion into air safety and that's why an investigation was started um police started investigating now how did the german press react to that incident yeah um the very first um, Newswire report says 
the object had been detected on radar. Um, and then um, a couple of hours later, they already had um, um, a quote from that BSET um, ideological skeptic uh, UFO researcher who must not be named, <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who at that time was still active. He is uh, dead now, by the way. Um, and he says, oh, it's uh, it's just a simple natural uh, explanation. Um, it's called radar angels, um, a phenomenon that air traffic control is no longer familiar with today. And he says, when radar signals are sent out, they break off somewhere on a skyscraper, a tree, or who knows where. Yeah. And this would then cause false signals. Um, yeah, but then so, there are also eyewitnesses, and I don't uh, think uh, yeah. exactly. So, but that doesn't that didn't really bother um, my mainstream colleagues much. They um, just um, minutes or an hour afterwards, big uh, German news outlets reported um, mystery resolved. It was just a radar return. And then um, the the, um, the the police uh, said, "Okay, we are investigating in the in the in the in the field of the of the drones or uh, drone fans. Maybe it was someone with a drone. Mm. Uh, we suspect that it may be a drone. We are investigating this. So it was their theory. It may be a drone." And then other news outlets, you know, immediately started reporting. Mystery resolved. It was just a drone, says police. You know. Um, now, do you think, uh, Robert, if I can interrupt for a second, yeah. um, that maybe uh, German authorities use the mainstream media as a, a way to calm down the, the, let's say, the general public, the general German public, uh, by, you know, uh, ex giving some explanation? Do you think this comes from above? No, I don't think that. Um, um, and also it would be something, if you say something like this here in Germany, you would instantly be called a conspiracy theorist or conspiracy narrator. That's how they call it now. Look, I ask, would, they, I, I ask questions for a living, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the, you know, as, as a journalist, you would call it a working hypothesis or something, right? But uh, but if you ask uh, questions like this, you're immediately uh, um, called a conspiracy theorist. No, but on the other hand, I really don't think that this is the government that has total control over the mass media in Germany. I don't think that. Um, no. What I do think, though, is that most for most journalists especially at that time back in 2014 when they weren't aware of anything going on outside of germany right. um they were still very convinced that ufos is a subject that you just don't have to deal with in a serious fashion um i mean i worked there myself i know how they tick um the thing is that i mean usually you would have you you would have standards as for due diligence for for journalists right which you would have to apply to each and every subject that you cover sure. um that is except for ufos because any intelligent person uh, especially when they work for television they know that there cannot be anything to ufos because otherwise we would have reported it right <laughs> so so that's why this whole subject has been neglected for decades by the german mass media and yeah. they are ridiculing themselves actually they have been ridiculing themselves when i mean up to the last moment when it was even possible to deny that there is something going on in the united states they have been denying and have been have been ridiculing the subject and 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 then only when president obama went on uh, on that talk show and and James stated Gordon. that there is uh, something flying around and we don't know what it is and we can't explain their flight characteristics was right. when they started to become awake say oh oh there seems to be something it's real and then it's real and then what what you know what what um what bothers me most is that they wouldn't lean back and say okay you know we told you wrong stuff all along you know we we didn't have a clue but we pretended we knew anything about this and so please excuse us and now we will try to work it to work it out and 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 and, and give you the the information as we learn it and um you know no they just switched position like this 180 degrees and said Oh yeah, well, we told you all along that there was something to it, you know. Uh, right. we, there was, you see. So um, anyway, but it's a very, it's a very human reflex, uh, which 
stems from fear, I think. You know, uh, whenever people uh, uh, observe something they cannot explain or identify, um, they tend to either just dismiss the whole thing or give it uh, some magical uh, 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 explanation, li like religion, angels, demons, uh, something like that. Uh, but they, they, the go-to emotion is um, just act like it's not there. You know, just what you just said. You know, even though there's a huge amount of information coming from the United States and maybe other parts of the world too, um, they still cho choose to stick their heads in the ground, right? Um, so my next question to you is, in 2017, the New York Times dropped uh, the now infamous article uh, along with footage from the Pentagon, from the, the, the military. Now, how was that picked up in Germany? It was uh, almost not picked up at all, especially not when it broke, when the story broke. It went uh, completely unnoticed by the German mainstream media. It was only um, about one year later that Spiegel, um, a big uh, weekly news magazine in Germany, um, had a story on it. And it was along the lines of, um, see those UFO wackos, uh, there's these old this old guys club uh, that uh, that uh, you know give uh, give each other money. Um, this Harry Reid and his buddies they um, they provisioned uh, twenty two million dollars and they send it over to their old buddy um, Bigelow. Uh, the the billionaire you know uh, Bob Bigelow yeah. and 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 he's also a wacko as we know because he's been into UFOs for such a long time and also. As we, uh, if we look at the videos released, doesn't it look like an airplane uh, filmed from behind with an infrared camera? Um, stuff like that, you know. Um, and we don't even know if they are, if they really are from the Pentagon. Um, st I mean, and they, and they wrote a, and they reported this kind of crap. Sorry for saying that, but they reported this kind of crap at the time when you could already know it better when if you would have investigated it if you would have studied uh the publications if you would have studied um the interviews given by lou elizondo um by even by the pentagon itself you know by the press spokesperson you would have known better as spiegel as germany's uh, allegedly leading um news magazine but uh, they decided to uh, turn it around the other way. And I mean, we have a show going on. I'm, I work with uh, two other colleagues who also used to work for, for mainstream t television. Um, uh, we have two shows and one of them is dedicated entirely to the UFO subject. It's called Erst Contact, so that's First Contact. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, and we started that show actually shortly after the, uh, the first um, word was heard uh, from the New York Times um, in December right. 2017. Um, just in order to keep up with everything that is happening there, and um, and so I know pretty well what has what was known at that time and what has become known since then. And uh, I can tell you that the German mainstream media they really only woke up to this whole thing when uh, President Obama started to speak about it, uh, because right. before that um, nothing would alter their course of of action. I mean. Even the German government, you know, the Washington Post had an article. Um, it, it was a commentary, but it was in the Washington Post saying UFOs are a fact and everyone needs to adapt to this fact. And UFOs exist and everyone needs to adapt to this fact or something. Um, and um, my colleague and I, we went to another press conference of the, of the German government. Um, I think it was in 2019. And right. asked them again and said, look, there's these press reports and um, they're concerned for air safety. Um, how is it that in Germany no one is concerned about UFOs? And are you telling me that you have not been following this subject at all if the United States have been tracking this for air safety reasons? And, you know, and the reaction was as usual. <laughs> no, we don't, nothing. Uh, you know, yeah. it was it was terrible. Yeah, T terrible, terrible. Now, um, Robert, you have been interviewing uh, some uh, key players in the UAP uh, disclosure traject, uh, like uh, Mr. Elizondo. Um, like you? Yeah. Excellent like interview, me. by the way. 
Yeah, um, I, I tried to follow yours in, in German, but I have a hard time understanding German. It was easier uh, for me to follow your excellent interview on this. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really need to uh, brush up my German. It uh, it was It's a long time. Actually, we Dutch, we, we get German in high school, but long story. So, aber ich spreche ein klein bisschen Deutsch. Wow. Aber nicht so gut mehr. No, sehr gut. Sehr gut. Genau, genau. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you've been covering uh, the UAP topic, interviewing the heavyweights, and which I, well, what I find very impressive is you, you take it up on you to, uh, you know, translate it in German, uh, dub it in German, so people in Germany get to follow what is happening properly. Um, now, Can you maybe tell me what was your most compelling interview with whom and um, what did you take from it? I interviewed so many people, I have to tell you. Um, um, I think one of, the, one of the most compelling interviews I did recently was with Jacques Vallée and Paola Harris on that uh, UFO um case uh, uh in 1945 right um the case itself is fascinating i mean um it was near the trinity test site and it was already two years before roswell and it was shortly after the first uf uh, uh, the first atomic bombs went off um right uh, so um that was interesting what was most interesting about this was um um, Jacques Vallée's concept of the meta-human control system. Because when you are so long in the field, like I am in, you've been working on this for quite some time as well, you know, um, you will probably confirm it that, you know, um, at one point you, you, you stop asking, okay, whether this is real or not, but you get interested in the more profound questions, you know, where do they come from? What's it all about? Um, yeah. And those really are the wise. questions that never let you go. Uh, once you started on that journey, um, once you went into that rabbit hole, it is really difficult to to get away from it. And and so um, it's very addictive. Very addictive. It is. It is, and it's mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, it's so fascinating. And and what is so fascinating to me is that I mean, how do you? How can you? Is there any any anything that can explain all of the cases? The whole that something. Is there any logical framework which unites all the cases and observations um, well. that have occurred? And and so um, I think it is a justified question whether or not uh, those objects did really crash here, or whether they seeded technology, or whether this is this is um, an a, so, um, a sociological endeavor by them well, that well, they, that they yeah. are actually showing up um not necessarily um because they have to do something here except for um making themselves known knocking on the door in a way you know trying to cause some kind of a psychological reaction in us and well, i think um that's an interesting uh, theory and also um If you think about, um, I mean, if you think about the fact that they they are probably using something like a warp drive or the Al Albuquerque drive, as, as uh, Luis Elizondo exp once explained to me on terrace in, in Rome, um, so they are literally able to bend space time, you know, like in Zack McCracken and the alien space time benders or something. You remember that uh, point yeah, and click yeah. adventure from the 80s. So yeah. they, they may literally be able to to bend space time. So if yeah. you're able to bend space time, how do you perceive your reality? Do you really do perceive it as some kind of a three dimensional compositum of length, width, and height um, with a linear time as we do, or do you or do you perceive? Do you live outside this uh, three dimensional world? And if so how do you perceive a three-dimensional world? Do you perceive it as we would perceive ants looking from above onto an anthill, maybe? Well, would I, you, I, how I, would I, you, and also would I, you also, the, the interesting question is, how would you perceive time? How would you, how would you perceive um, what we, what we perceive as um, a cause and result? How would you, 
perceive that? Would you probably be able to to understand a process in its entirety before it has even started? And then if you do understand it that way, would you would you be um, would you be trying to 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 set off certain processes of let's say self-reflection in others or psychological processes would you would you try to set something off um, in order to achieve something rather than fighting against another process a certain process that has been going on like we do you know I mean so this is so interesting and and um, um, one of the you know one of the reasons why I asked him about the meta human control system was that um, both Luis Elizondo and many many others um, have uh, described uh, UFOs emerging from the sea uh, diving into the sea um, yes, sir. stuff and and I think that's really interesting because um, if you think about it if you were let's say a very advanced species you may have created the planet or the or some of the living beings on it or you may be just there as an observer sometimes you are being observed with your with your ufo when you when you arrive or when you leave or whatever um but would it make any sense to fly um a couple of thousand light years to the nearest uh, star system with a habitable planet um you yeah, I mean, would it would it be logical to assume that they um, that they come from very far away and just circle around in our atmosphere and then fly back thousands of years? And that is actually one of the basic arguments of the of 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 most skeptics here in Germany. They say it doesn't make any sense. Why would they? There's so huge distances between the stars. Why would they fly yeah, so thousands of light years exactly, just exactly to circle like around Mueller. and then to fly back? You know, and and of course, I have to agree, it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, but so if they Neil were, deGrasse Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson says the exact same thing. Yeah, but Why if would... they, but if they are observing us, and a lot of um, a lot of evidence points point to that um, hypothesis, then um, then one must assume that they may have bases on Earth. And if they have bases on Earth, where would those bases be? Would they probably be in a place where we cannot reach them, like in on the on the, the ocean. oceans in the oceans? And and if they have bases, are they already living among us um, without us knowing that they're living among us? I mean, this is so interesting. You know, I could yeah. I could go on for hours about this. Anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, what, what's interesting to me is that. Uh, when my uh, in one of my interviews with Lou Elizondo, um, you know, I, I was asking him about what we observe, the behavior of the UAP, you know, whatever we we can see with our systems, our eyes, our senses. Um, and I said, uh, he said actually uh, that whatever we observe may not be uh, the the reality they are in it, for example they might move way quicker to the eye for us but it could be that they are interdimensional and they are actually moving very slowly and maybe are on earth, uh, like an earth safari or something look at the talking monkeys yeah. or something like yeah, that exactly. you know? yeah um but um what's also very interesting is to uh elaborate on the patterns that are being noticed of these uaps and where they show up again back to the behavior um, as you know uh, there are many accounts and actually there's a huge pattern for decades they show up above places where there's nuclear weapons stored or nuclear plants um, now uh, that to me uh, looks like um, and and you know there there's many accounts of them uh, taking out actually uh, nuclear weapons to me, that looks like uh, protective behavior, you know, uh, protect the it's it's like when my son finds a pack of uh, matches and, uh, you know, uh, he, he's about to strike one off and he doesn't know what he's really doing. He could set the house on fire, hurt himself. I'll yeah, just but, take then, but, then, the but then but then you but then you have cases like the. Bielo Korovice in Ukraine in 1980 something uh, where that UFO not only activated um, the uh, nukes missiles uh, nuclear missiles um, underground 
but they they also changed the um, the target's coordinates in in the launch computer and initiated the launch sequence. And then shortly before they fired off, um, they um, um, they finished uh, they terminated that launch procedure by themselves. Um, and uh, it was never the, known. The, it the was Russians, never known. The Ukrainians did, or huh? Sorry. The Ukrainians uh, terminated their own uh, sighting? No, 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 no. The UFO, the UFO that had initiated the launch sequence of those right. nuclear missiles after it had reprogrammed the, the targets, right. um, terminated the launch sequence. Uh, the, the Ukrainians couldn't do anything. Well, and that, looks to like me, looks threat. more like a show of force. It doesn't necessarily yeah, threat, look yeah. benevolent, you know? It looks like, look who's in charge. Um, we are in charge. And... And there's uh, there are other a lot of other examples like that. I mean, whenever I mean you surely know about the Parvis Jafari case, you know, with the uh, physical interaction between the craft and the and the the fighter jet, where all yes. the instruments um, from went from Iran offline, Iran, yes, nineteen seventy six or so, and 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 you have a couple of cases like that, and. Uh, and then you know you start to wonder what is what is the what is the message here? And the, I think the message is we are superior. Uh, we are here. Um, get used to it. I think that is that is um, one one of the conclusions you could draw. I think, and also um, what is highly interesting, as you already noticed, the the clear interest in nuclear facilities. Um, yeah. I, when when I interviewed Luis Elizondo, he said. Um, when you sometimes you can even see how they are searching certain spots in a particular pattern, much as we would do when we um, uh, try to um, <clears throat> to investigate a place, to to search a place, to to look at it, to observe it. Right. Uh, so they behave like spies sometimes. You know, sometimes they behave yeah, like, like scouts. Yeah, drones. Scouts. So yeah. 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 So, so, um, so the benevolent factor, okay, maybe benevolent, may also be preparing an invasion, maybe something completely else. We can't, we can't understand. I mean, um, well, I, I you know, I, I, I wonder. Look, the, the, this pattern has been uh, manifesting itself for decades, like right after the, uh, during the war, before the war, uh, basically when we started messing around with uh, splitting atoms and stuff. Um, so to me if they would have invaded or or you know uh, really wanted to show force they could they could have done it decades ago and if they are so technologically advanced well what can we do against them nothing so to me i d i don't think it's it might be show of force but more in in a way to uh, uh give us a message stop fucking around with nuclear weapons you will hurt ourselves you, yourselves you can uh, really uh, uh, mess with the, the balance in the universe if you do that, because everything will be out of balance if if, they're, if we blow up the Earth, basically. Um, so I do think, and this is, of course, all me. This is my speculation, my hypoth uh, hypothesis. Um, so I, I, I don't feel it's in, it, it is a little intimidating for to towards us, but I don't think it's uh, aggressive i think it's more likely protective in, in a way it's it's also likable isn't it uh, like uh um th the military is always used to being superior to the others you know who has the biggest biggest guns biggest uh mm -hmm. rockets biggest nukes biggest you know this mm -hmm. this sort of typical uh, male mine is bigger you know uh, this <laughs> This kind of yeah, this, yeah. Uh, discussion, and and then you suddenly have a phenomenon that shouldn't be there, and and th th that is just difficult for the uh, the military to admit it, it its existence just because it's there and it's even more superior than they are. Um, yeah. And and I think that that puts us back into uh, the place where we belong psychologically. You know that uh, I think it's especially in those times now it is it is very helpful and and. And um, it is uh, healthy, psych psychologically healthy, to rem to remind oneself that we are obviously not the brightest candle on the cake. We are just one among many other species, 
and um, and, and there may yeah, be and other species out there, and we may, uh, you know, and and we have a place, we have our position uh, in the universe, and uh, also, yeah, yeah. Also, we are very very uh, new on the evolutionary timeline, right? Right. You know, it, the, the for example, the dinosaurs have had been roaming the Earth for uh, hundreds of millions of years. We started walking straight up about 50,000 years ago. Mm. <laughs> and in the last 100 years, 200 years, we've actually really been developing technologically. Um, so, you know, we're brand new. You know, we, we should be humble in that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that too. I think that too. And sometimes yeah. there are cases, I have another interesting case I would like to mention here, if you, if you let me, if yeah, you're sure, interested. And that is um, uh, at one at one time I um, I gave a presentation somewhere. It was in a in a German UFO association, I, I, and it was about UFOs. And then after that after that presentation, um, a man uh, walked up to me. Um, he seemed to be in his sixties or so, and he said, uh, "Rob, that was an interesting." Um, that was an interesting presentation, um, but I'd like to tell you something that may help you uh, getting a clearer image about what's happening in Germany concerning UFOs. And he uh, revealed that he had been a very, very high-ranking um, member of the German military for many years. He worked in high government ranks for 14 years, including the German Ministry of Defense and SHAPE, NATO headquarters in Brussels, yes. and he was um, <clears throat> listening to my uh, lecture and came up to me and said, I have to tell you something. I had my own UFO encounter, and wow. I said, wow, so that's interesting. Tell me about it. And, and it is, by the way, it is for specific reasons. I'm not mentioning his real rank, but I can assure you it is <laughs> one of the highest, the very highest ranks you can, uh, you can get in the military. Um, it's just Are that you, he has to stay me, anonymous. He, yes, he wanted. Well, I know, I know who he is actually. And um, by the way, and years later, um, I had finally convinced him to go on uh, to go on camera. But he said, uh, "Look, I'm talking only to you, Robert, only to you and to your subscribers. So if you want to inv want to um, interview me, that's fine. Uh, don't mention, but just don't mention my name on YouTube and don't show my face. Y you can show it in the closed membership section to your subscribers. I have no problem with that, but I do not want to be seen. Um, and that is for specific reasons, which I cannot go into now. It has nothing to do with uh, Secret Service or anything. It's it's nothing very um, spectacular. spectacular. It is actually just for uh, con concern for for others um, that he does not want to reveal uh, publicly his his uh, position sure. that he had let's let's leave it at that um, so uh, so what he experienced was that in uh, December 1982 um, he was um, on a on a rescue mission he because he was um, a medical doctor in the army mm -hmm. um, in 1982, he was a medical doctor, and uh, his mission was to save an old man who had suffered a cardiac arrest. And um, since there were no medical helicopters, emergency helicopters available in that region at that time, the military was called in to assist with their search and rescue helicopter. And they flew that old man to the helicopter. And when they returned to their base in Fassberg in Lower Saxony, um, in the middle of the night, between midnight, midnight and 1 a.m., um, uh, the weather was very, very bad. It was low clouds, drizzling rain. I mean, you know what weather can be like in winter in Germany um, at nights. Um, so it was really, really bad weather. And the helicopter had to fly at a very low altitude, around 50 meters above the surface, around 20 meters above the treetops um, because the weather was so bad. And then when they arrived in, a, in an area near the small town Eschede, uh, they suddenly noticed some glowing lights on the ref on, on the left hand side, and they wondered why is it glowing in the clouds? Um, it was uh, a bright light comparable to that of a spotlight, but it, he said it had a different quality. He describes the light as being very bright, 
green whitish light, but which didn't hurt the eye. And mm. he said the light was continuously flowing, he said, like water from a spring. And wow. this light accompanied them, uh, flew, uh, flew alongside them. The distance was difficult to ascertain, but he estimated around uh, 100 meters. They were flying with 160 kilometers per hour. And the pilot also said to the onboard mechanic, who's flying there this weather? And they were wondering if it was some secret aircraft and decided to call the nearby um, air control tower of nearby airfield Langenhagen to check whether they had uh, air traffic. But the controller answered, they only had their helicopter on the screen and nothing else. The strange light accompanied the helicopter for about one to two minutes and then suddenly made a sharp right angle turn towards them. And they were all shocked. The, the pilot tore the helicopter sharply down right. And so um, he told me since he was sitting on, on the left-hand side of the helicopter and the mm -hmm. pilot had tore the, the, the helicopter down right, he was now sitting up on the you know, upside and, and he was able to look at that object. And um, the object um, hovered uh, shortly above their um, helicopter and then uh, it shot off. And the onboard mm -hmm. mechanic screamed, watch out, you're getting into the tree. So they had, would have almost crashed. I mean, this this uh, near, it was a near miss, you know, they, um, the, the object would have almost collided with the helicopter wow. and the and the helicopter, this evasive action by the helicopter would have almost caused it to crash. So um, the object changed its direction very rapidly, shot upwards in the air where it disappeared into another glowing cloud and Fortunately, the pilot managed to stabilize the helicopter again. Um, and then they, they landed somewhere um, in, in the forest, um, in a small clearing. Um, and Or they, they didn't land or they kept hovering there for a couple of minutes to see if the light would return and to right. sort of digest what had just happened, you know. And uh, they also contacted Airfield Langenhagen again to verify whether they had anything on their radar screens and they said no but we just saw you flying a strange maneuver and after a while they continued their flight back to Fassberg and the weather was really really really, really bad um, and um, and they after the landing they swore to each other that they would never ever talk about this to anybody um, it's very common and, among and, military men and he said and he said the light he said demonstrated such yeah. an incredible maneuverability way beyond anything he had seen before mass inertia law didn't seem apply seem to apply to it which is why he is not sure if it was a solid object at all hmm. and um, there were no physical interferences with the helicopter besides of the static on the radio when it was near the helicopter so that hmm. was interesting um, and he kept quiet with this incident he kept it for many decades until around 2012 he read the French Cometa report and in the French Cometa report he found similar sighting reports and that is the reason why he decided he could now talk about it wow wow and um, have has he ever extended you uh, some of the names he was with uh, people you can potentially interview about that uh, uh... no he has not and he said i think my colleagues would be pretty um angry if they knew that i that i broke the promise that we gave uh, right. that they had given one another right yeah. right but right. i do believe i have no reason to believe his story i heard him several times talk about this he has made an extensive report uh, written report anonymous report to one of the german ufo associations um, it is everything is perfectly logical. Uh, he has never changed even one uh, tiny bit of his story, um, and he is not interested in publicity whatsoever. Uh, that's have, the other thing, you, you know. He is not interested. Hmm? Have you been able to maybe uh, obtain the circumstances uh, that day, or maybe civilian witness accounts to whatever these military men were seeing, or? Maybe there was some radar data you could, uh, you know. Uh... Uh, no, I know that the, um, uh, the the German UFO Association, which uh, released their f uh, this uh, case in in their UFO uh, 
uh, Bolichin, uh, uh, they made some research and they couldn't find anything which would contradict his his story. But of course, right. it's a long time ago. And, uh, you know, you see in the end, it's just a story um, and you have nothing tangible, uh, which is different in another case, which um, happened in 1960, in 76, because um, that was a case where uh, the pilot of a Piper Arrow aircraft was flying when he noticed a strange light approaching from northeast. Right. And after three to five minutes, the object came closer and took a fixed wing position, a fixed position of the Piper's left wing. The object was oval shaped and very bright, yellow in its center with an indistinct flame orange boundary. Um, and this object then uh, started to circle around this Piper aircraft, um, um, which caused the um, which caused the plane itself to rotate around its own axis, uh, oh. 360 degrees. And then the the pilot called Mayday Mayday on the radio, um, and um, um, and soon. After that, two U.S. Air Force F-4 Phantom jets arrived on either side of him um, and um, escorted the Piper aeroplane to an airfield, uh, to a civilian airfield, I think it was. Um, and um, after the landing, um, a military van without license plates pulled up to his plane and five men in business suits got out. They would not identify who they worked for. He was taken <laughs> to an underground room on the airport property where a man sat um, behind a desk and two of the original men left the room. The others then began asking him detailed questions about the sighting. Um, he had the impression that one of those pe people wa was an American um, and they questioned, they questioned him for about three hours and he had to repeat the entire event again and again and again and answer all the technical questions. Um, and then he was politely asked to read and sign a form printed in German, and it was uh, something like a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and he declined to sign that form, despite the fact that it was firmly suggested to him that his pilot's license might be suspended if he did not do so. Wow. And after this, they let him go. And uh, finally, uh, later, it was discovered that parts of the aircraft's landing gear were strongly and permanently magnetized and they had to be replaced at a later date. And that was uh, that case was investigated by Dr. Richard Haynes and oh. um, it was published in the International UFO Reporter, KUFOS Volume 24, um, a couple of years ago. So... Um, That is another case which, you know, which leaves you wondering, okay, who is actually investigating uh, serious air force or serious military incursions by, by UFOs? Who is investigating this in Germany? And, um, and then well, you, uh, have a, you have, you have a, a, a big American presence uh, since uh, the war ended, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, the, uh, and, and the man that I had um, mentioned before, the high-ranking uh, military uh, um, officer yeah. from the German, the former high-ranking military officer from the German Bundeswehr, uh, he told me, you know, you need to understand that Germany um, was uh, an occupied country. Um, during uh, the uh, German separation. You know, the U.S. occupation zone was down in the south, um, and then the French zone was in the west and on, on the French border, and the British occupied the northern part of Western Germany. And Germany was not a sovereign state until 1990, and he said that uh, the air supremacy during that time was divided among the Allied powers, and this right. has led... That's, that's what uh, the high-ranking military officer said. He said uh, German authorities um, b became sort of resignated about this and afraid to take responsibility uh, over their own matters. And over the years, this, he said, has become sort of institutionalized. Whenever there was something bizarre, the Germans were happy to leave it to the Allied powers, mainly to the United States, UK, and France. Right. And... Um, And I think the Piper Arrow incident that I just described may demonstrate or may show that this could possibly be the case. I have to to be careful here because I don't know, you yeah. know, 
But I yeah. mean, it's it's really diff it's uh, interesting that um, a, a civilian pilot is then questioned by uh, U.S. military guys uh, on German soil and asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, right, and it it ties in perfectly with what what you hear in other uh, cases. You know. Um, like even the Pavis Jafari case in Iran or other ca right. other cases where Americans show up and, and question the witnesses and you know um, so um, so it may be that the Germans they just uh, left this whole subject to uh, the American um, to the American military occupying um, <clears throat> sorry being stationed in Germany. I get it. Uh, by the way, if you hear something, my son just came home with uh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, this is interesting because, of course, you know, uh, I can identify uh, as we have an American presence in the Netherlands of, or had. Um, but that was because, um, well, you know, let's talk about that more in uh, in in our talk next time uh, when I'm on your show. Um, so uh, let's round this up a little bit. Um, I would like to know, uh, Robert, what are your uh, plans for the near future with your channel? What can we expect from you and where can people see your stuff? Okay, so first uh, first things first, people can see my stuff on our YouTube channel, which is Exomagazine TV, youtube.com slash Exo Magazine TV is written like Exo Magazine be in the description. E after the end. So Exo Magazine TV. Uh, also go to exomagazine.tv or exopolitik.org. That's with a K at the end of um, the, um, the word. Um, and um, as for my future plans, well, I'm, I'm not alone a lonely fighter anymore um there's a very exciting international network of ufo um, experts and scientists um that has emerged from the shadows <laughs> i would say it is called the international coalition for extraterrestrial research um it's uh it entails it, it and uh, contains um or is grouped formed by um, scientists, radio astronomers, uh, former military, former policemen, um, long, decade-long, serious UFO investigators, I think from 46 countries now, we are so many, and I'm proud to be the German representative of the ISER um, network. And awesome. um, we are, yes, and we are trying to um, to get grips on this phenomenon and to try to find it out with an international perspective because it's so interesting what the Russians think about it, you know, what people from New Zealand think about it or from Romania or from uh, what have you. We even have people from Japan. I mean, um, it's, it's really, really interesting uh, to talk to all of these people and we are also um, uniting. We will meet the next time we will um, meet. I mean, we meet regularly online, but the next time we will meet um, in person will be at the World Ufology uh, Congress in Barcelona in October, um, where yes. we are some of us will be represented. Um, Roberto Pinotti from Italy, for example. Um, Gary Hasseltein is coming. Uh, I am coming. Uh, Josep Guijarro, who is also a TV journalist from Spain, who, he, who will be present. And many others. Um, um, I'm, I'm not right now. I can't tell you the whole list, but I can tell you it's going to be very, very interesting. So if you uh, think you I, would want to meet some of us, go to that World Ufology Congress in Barcelona, uh, which is an excellent. I think it's one of the most important events um, in terms of UFOs in Europe this year. I know. I know a couple of people who are uh, going to be there, and uh, you know that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, by the way, Robert, are you going to San Marino, 10th of uh, September? No, I would love to, actually, and I'm invited, but there is a very, very important private um, appointment that I have to uh, respect. And my my wife already said that uh, she would find some very creative ways to kill me if I dare to go there. <laughs> Probably so, very true painful. love, you see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, sir, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was great meeting you. And uh, by the way, we need to do this again very soon because I'm not done talking to you <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, this, uh, this is uh, an open invita uh, invitation for a follow-up. 
Um, so, yes, please. Uh, yes, yes. Let's continue this. Yeah. Yeah. Without further, um, you know. Uh, uh, by the way, thank you the the audience that uh, that is watching this. Um, and uh, Robert, I'll be following you uh, very closely online. People uh, subscribe to Robert Fleischer's channel on YouTube. Um, and uh, well, thank you for watching. And Robert, uh, till next time, uh, my friend. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Anytime. Okay.